we're talking trees. Trees may, maybe aren't the answer to everything, but holy cow, are trees cool. And I think we're all cool for paying attention to trees and wanting to learn about trees. I would say, be proud of your work. And I applaud you for being a part of this, of all the things people can be doing in their lives. Um, when you think about it in the background, trees are so important. So keep doing this. I applaud you and, and let's keep working it together. Trees really do. This is what I tell people I run into. You may not know a lot about trees or even think you appreciate them. But if you live in Nebraska and the trees went away overnight, I don't think anybody would stay here. <laughs> they just make our communities, our farms, our homesteads, our houses just so much more comfortable. So let's be proud of that and work hard at that. Like I mentioned earlier, um, this is normally done over a longer period of time. We will rush through things. It's gonna feel a little rushed, but you will get a notification. Uh, Chrissy's gonna to pull together a resource page related to all of these uh, tree care workshops, and you'll have a link to that. So this PowerPoint, don't worry about taking notes real hard right now. We'll have it up for you, and you can get everything out of it later on, okay? And I do not mind, I like tree challenges. Do not hesitate to send me an email. Anything you want about trees, tree ID, tree questions, fun facts. I try to gather fun facts about trees and share them with people. Don't hesitate to send me one to my email and let's have a conversation um, beyond even this program today, I hope. So why care about tree ID? Of all the things we can do in our world and our lives, why do we care about tree ID? Well, for tree professionals, the need to know the differences of our most common trees is really important. This is especially critical for identifying pests and diseases or how we're going to care for trees. If you don't know the tree you're looking at, I don't know how you can assign care practices to it properly. And then think about this do any of you get? These door hangers, I get door hangers. <laughs> I shouldn't probably name companies, but company, various companies will put door hangers on my door and it'll say the, the green ash in your front yard probably needs a treatment. And I don't even have a green ash in my front yard. So if people are doing that, we're not being um, really good stewards of our trees. And those of us in the tree profession, we really need to raise the bar about what we're trying to do. And then I always say, man, if you know a little bit about trees, you don't have to know a lot, just a little bit. You can really impress your friends and family. I know it sounds crazy, but if you're out hiking in the woods and you can name most of the trees, they'll, they'll think you're a god sometimes. Well, maybe not that, but still, it's a lot of fun. So learn a few trees, impress your friends and family, have fun at the holidays. It's worth the effort. And I think just expanding our minds, you know, all the things we can be thinking about in this day and age, our modern living, you know, we're inundated with all these exterior things that are driving at our attention. Well, knowing trees is a way to kind of just soften what we're doing and connect us to nature, maybe smooth our mind a little bit, calm us down a little bit. What we'll try to do today is a couple things. Understand the plant classification system so that we know how to identify, not just identify trees, but how we name them so we all know we're talking about the same tree. Identify the key plant characteristics for telling trees apart. Identify a few of the benefits and limitations of some of the trees we're talking about. We will not do this one about plant health care today but that will be coming up further uh, in the presentations in the Tree Care Workshop series. And then I would tell you this, if you are really anxious to learn to identify trees and you're starting from kind of a baseline, not knowing a lot, it can feel overwhelming. But man, you know, like doing a crossword puzzle every day, just spend a little time doing it. You don't have to dive deep to just start building that day after day a little bit of practice uh, on a daily basis will get you there quicker than you realize. <clears throat> and 
And maybe I should say this too right up front. Um, we don't know exactly, but in Nebraska, anywhere from 300 to 400 species or hybrids of trees could be grown here, either naturally existing or in our parks and arboretums. So that sure sounds overwhelming about what you're gonna try and ID and know apart. But in reality, the things that are in the background of our daily lives, there's probably two to three dozen species that are most common out there. And if you focus on those first, that the rest will come. We definitely wanna spend a little time today reminding ourselves what ash trees look like. Thanks a lot, EAB, coming to Nebraska and it's gonna kill 40 million of our ash trees in the coming years. Uh, it won't kill them all, but it's gonna kill most of them. And it's really gonna drastically change um, our communities. And when we think about this, what are the trees we're gonna plant back to, to replace or, or maybe to help bridge the gap? We probably want some trees that resemble ash or grow like ash. Well, let's know what our trees are and identification is one way to do that. There are a lot of great resources to help you figure out tree ID. When I first started learning it, I had to use books. Um, and one of the best, I don't, I don't know if you can see this, is the Audubon Guide to uh, Woody Plant or Tree ID for North America. If you can track this down, this is a handy pocket guide that fits in your pocket. And if you're ever traipsing through the woods, there's an Eastern and a Western variety of this that's really good for learning the most of our trees. But today, man, with Google, and now I know there are apps that we put on our phone, and you guys will have to tell me, I haven't done this, but I've heard of one called Plant Snap. You take a snap or picture of it, and it'll tell you what the tree is. Well, that's cheating. I had to no, learn. No, that's efficiency. That's efficiency. Right on, Chrissy. <laughs> yeah, so take advantage of technology. I'm starting to do this with birds because I really like to try and identify birds. So yeah, use that technology. I use Google. There's a great website, trees.unl.edu. On the Nebraska Forest Service, we have trees to plant website. And then here are a few websites that I use that because of they're the upper Midwest and they're the same kinds of trees we grow. The Wisconsin DNR has a good page. Champaign County, Illinois, the Winter Tree ID Pocket for Winter Tree ID. Tree Topics at the College of DuPage. UP Tree ID from Michigan State University. And then the National Arbor Day Foundation, what tree is that? I mentioned this briefly, but this has really come on the last couple of years, thanks to Eric North at the University of Nebraska. There's a really great tree ID page now through the School of Natural Resources. Go to uh, UNL, trees.unl.edu and you will get there. Look at Justin, that. Justin? Yes. What was the full name of the Avedon Guide? Audubon. Audubon, Audubon, Audubon. Guide, Audubon. Yeah, the Audubon Guide. The Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Trees. My darn background doesn't show this very well. It's a dark brown little book that can fit in the pocket. Let's see if I can show this. It doesn't work with this green screen stuff, but yeah. it gives you pictures as well as a written description of these trees. And it's broken down into Eastern and Western region. And Nebraska straddles that. So if you're in Scotts Bluff, I'd get the Western region. If you're in Lincoln, I'd get the Eastern region, but both have some overlap. Okay, we talked about uh, just this website here is gonna be a really good one for our part of the world. And then old style books, I mentioned it, the Audubon Guide, there's one by Bag Bagley and Sutton. Here's one by Guy Sternberg from uh, Illinois who wrote the book on oaks in uh, North America. And then I picked up a fun little one. This has been really good for me. Uh, the Trees of the Smokies, uh, the Smoky Mountain National Park uh, is a really good little guide, a pocket guide, only nine bucks. But it has about 90% of the same trees we would see in Eastern Nebraska. So a little pocket guide. 
I hope that helps you get you off to a good start. And then here's one I would say, look up online. Dave Muter and Mike Coons, who's also, these, Dave Muter passed away. He's our former Nebraska Community Forestry Coordinator, just a great guy. And Mike Coons, who's still doing work out in Utah now, they wrote Trees of Nebraska, and I don't have it handy with me, but it's a PDF available now online, free of charge. And it's a really great little uh, line drawing pictures of trees, as well as a good little key for identifying our most common trees in Nebraska. Great little guide that they put together 30 or 40 years ago. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but in the plant classification system, this is pretty important as how we name our plants so that we know what we're talking about. And this is just the classification of red maple. And if we spend a little time looking at this, it starts as the kingdom. There's a phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Acer rubrum, red maple, part of the genus maple. And we used to call it part of the maple, it is part of the maple family, but the bigger order it is in is now in the soapberry family. They shifted it to the soapberry family, uh, Sapindales or Sapindaceae. And I don't know why the botanists do this to this all the time, but the soapberry and the Acer family, the maple family are closely related. And once you start IDing trees in the field, you're gonna start seeing how these family characteristics meld apart different genus and species. It's kind of fun once you get the hang of it. When we talk about plant nomenclature, um, in a technical sense, we try to talk about trees with their scientific or their Latin name. And so Quercus macrocarpa is bur oak. Now, generally speaking, and in an audience like this tonight, we can probably use common names mostly so we don't confuse people. But if you really want to make sure you know what species you're talking about amongst people in the field, you're going to use the scientific name. And that's a system that use, is a binomial system. It uses two parts of the name, the genus and the species. So uh, Quercus macrocarpa, the genus is Quercus oak. Macrocarpa is the species bur oak. Now we will have varieties of those and cultivars of those, and we'll show you a little bit of how we uh, write those out in a nomenclature sense. <clears throat> but here is why it's important. Carpinus caroliniana is not native to Nebraska, but we grow it here. It's a common Eastern US tree. It's the American hornbeam, but it's also known as the blue beech, the ironwood, and the musclewood. Well, there's another tree in the birch family called Australia Vir virginiana. It's the American hop hornbeam, also called ironwood. How do we know what we're talking about if we say ironwood? I'm in Nebraska and you're in Connecticut. You have two different trees in mind probably. So that's why we come down to scientific names. And then here's a fun one. Serviceberry, Amelanchier canadensis, uh, is the Can Canadian service berry, but service berries generally, look at all these names, Juneberry, service berry, service tree, shadbush. <laughs> so after a while, we need to make sure we know what we're talking about. And here's just how we put out that nomenclature across a couple of species. Quercus alba, the white oak. Quercus is oak, alba means white. So that's why we have the common name white oak. Acer rubrum. Acer is maple, rubrum is red, red maple. And this is a particular cultivar called red sunset. When we're naming our species, we use italics for the genus and species, but then we put in single quotes the cultivar name. There are varietal names for certain species. For example, honey locust. Gladitsia triacanthus, variety in Nermus. All that means thorn, thornless honey locust. And then here's the cultivar name Sunburst, which is a yellow foliaged variety of honey locust. You can't buy any more because it's a bad tree. It doesn't live very long. It's stupid, so don't try to plant one, but that's what it's named 
uh, in a technical sense. Triacanthus, it's fun to play with these names sometimes. Triacanthus re uh, refers to the tri-barbed or the three barbed prongs of the thorns of honey locust. And we'll look at thorns later on. And then here's one that's a hybrid. If it's a hybridized tree, a cross between two different species, you'll have this bi symbol, Acer bi fromanii or Acer times fromanii. And that means it's a, a hybridized variety. This particular one is the autumn blaze cultivar of the Freeman maple, which is now the most commonly planted tree across America. And maybe we shouldn't plant so much of it. It's not a bad tree, but uh, we need to be aware of that. When we talk about tree ID, there are some important, of course, every tree is identified by its morphology, its physical characteristics that are different between tree and tree. Duh, Justin, you really helped me out there a lot. But here are kind of the basics of that I, things I would have in my back pocket for tree ID tips in terms of morphology. Remember the mad buck principle. We'll talk about this in a minute about opposite buds and branching. Simple leaves versus compound leaves. That is really critical for deciduous trees. If you see a tree with compound leaves, you narrow it down to about 10 species right away, or genus maybe. Uh, the leaf shape, of course, the margins, the surface texture, is it hairy, fragrance, etc. And let's think about fragrance. We're not gonna hit it on, on it a lot tonight, but there are a lot of trees that we really get good clues about their ID from how they smell. And we'll talk about that a little bit. The growth habit. Is it an excurrent upright tree or a rounded decurrent tree? Bark texture and colors. Twigs, buds, leaf scars, lenticels, fruits, flower shape, color, and fragrance. And then I would remember this, if you can, about botany a little bit. Monoecious versus dioecious trees. Monoecious trees are trees that have male and female flowers on the same tree. They're not always self-fertile, but you don't have different male and female trees. Dioecious trees are, male, are separated male and female trees. Maples and ash trees are dioecious. There's male and female varieties, whereas monoecious re would refer to something like an oak tree uh, has both male and female flowers on it. These are the basic leaf types that we think about. Broadleaf leaves, usually deciduous angiosperm, but not always. An angiosperm just means a flowering tree. Um, and Chrissy will actually get into this later when we wrap up. Needle leaf, plus all and scale-like leaves, always coniferous. Those are conifers when they have needles, but they're not always evergreen. And bald cypress is a perfect example of that. Deciduous, they lose their, their leaves and then replace their leaves every year. And then evergreen retains most green foliage year to year. Typically coniferous in our area, but not always. There are a few uh, broadleaf evergreens here. So a deciduous broadleaf would be a red oak or a maple. Deciduous conifer, larch bald cypress. Broadleaf evergreen, a live oak or a holly. And believe it or not, somebody sent me a picture just the other day of a really incredible, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank here, magnolia from down in Brownville. And it was a evergreen magnolia that shouldn't be growing in Nebraska, but here it is 15 years later. And maybe that's telling us what climate change is doing. And then coniferous evergreen, things like pine and spruce. And one more thing I'll throw at you here. This really, I use a lot, this whole concept of marcescent leaves uh, for deciduous. It doesn't just have to be leaves, but usually it's related to leaves. It could also include fruit, but things that wither and die, but are retained through the winter. Oak trees do this a lot, when they're, especially when they're young. Beech trees, carpinus, and I would also say sugar maple. Uh, if they're hanging on to these things in the winter, that gives us a good ID characteristic. So Mad Buck is this acronym that relates to maple, ash, dogwood, and buckeyes being oppositely branched or the opposite bud set on the twigs and the stems. Do you see that? 
how the stem, the twigs are coming out opposite from each other on the branch, or the leaves would do that too. That's really an important part of how we identify trees. And so that comes back to this whole concept of leaf bud branch arrangement. Opposite are those things like maple ash, dogwood, buckeye. But remember, there's also a few others, lilac, katsura tree, and cork tree. We don't see these a lot in Nebraska, but lilac you do. And then there's one other thing I'll throw at you here that's in this group, viburnums. Viburnums, especially in eastern Nebraska, can get to be tree size, black haw viburnum and nannyberry viburnum. And they are native, and you might run into them in the landscape and go, what the heck is that? It's opposite branching, nothing like I ever saw before. It's a small tree. It could be a viburnum. All the other trees are considered alternate, except for there's one oddball in the uh, dogwood group, which is pagoda dogwood, cornus alternifolia. Why did that guy end up with alternate buds and branching? It's a quick... Uh, weird kind of a thing, quirk of nature. There is a species that's considered world, which is catalpa, and actually cork tree and catalpa I would put together under the world category. And then two ranked, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but two ranked refers to uh, leaves that come out on the same plane across from each other, not necessarily opposite, but they're on the same plane. They're not spinning around the twig, but elms, yews, hemlocks, fir, and dawn redwood, those are considered two ranked, and that's kind of a helpful ID characteristic for those. This time of year, when we look at twigs and branches, we can really use a lot of clues to help us with tree ID from the way their buds look to the bud scars, the bundle scars, the lenticels. There's all kinds of things that help us with winter tree ID. But here's the whole concept of an opposite bud arrangement here on the left with this viburnum. And these are alternate here on the right. There's all kinds of names for the shape of our leaves, especially our simple leaves. And I'll be honest with you, I do not keep up with this. I do not know this nomenclature. I don't use it a lot. I just say, oh, okay, my eyes are telling me that looks like a a flat base of a cottonwood leaf. That looks like the dentated base of a linden leaf. That looks like a heart shape of a red bud leaf. But if you want to work on it, you can figure out all these different names for the shapes of our leaves. The one thing I would point out that's important here, though, is the edges of the leaves. And this is where we tend to think about things either being serrated, dentated, or smooth. And those things really do apply to tree ID, and we'll talk about that as we go along. And then how do you name some of these simple leaves with lobes? Here is a sugar maple leaf. These are lobed leaves. They have these uh, prominent lobes, and then the sinuses are the indentations between the lobes. This is sugar maple. Here's a type of oak. This is uh, Quercus rober or English oak. These are the sinuses between the lobes. And those are very distinctive for maples and oaks that help us uh, identify them. Then we get into compound leaves. And there's different ways to name and label compound leaves. But primarily, there are three types. Pinnately compound leaves, like this Amaramachia. Bipinnately, or twice compound leaves, like this honey locust. And then palmately like a, a, the palm of a hand, which would be more like a buckeye, and we'll look at those. Flower structures can be a part of our tree ID. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but flower structures are pretty important. And when you see catkins coming off of a tree in winter or early spring, that quickly helps you narrow it down to the kind of tree it's going to be, probably in the birch family or a type of cottonwood or a willow or an alder. And then different types of fruits definitely help us figure out the kinds of trees we're looking at, uh, deciduous fruits and evergreen fruits, and we'll talk about that. Six o'clock, okay, we're all right. Let's right up front spend a little time, re, re, uh, I guess, reacquainting ourselves to ash 
Here in the winter, we're not seeing the leaves, but these are our ash trees out in the landscape. Let's remember what they're about because we need to really be able to identify those related to emerald ash borer now. Opposite branching, pinnately compound leaves, seven to nine leaflets typically for both green ash and white ash, ending in a single leaflet. These are the primary differences between green ash and white ash. The green ash has a D-shaped leaf scar. We'll look at that. The white ash has a C-shaped leaf scar. Both have fuzzy buds that resemble Hershey's Kisses, uh, kind of in the grayish or brownish uh, color. They both have distinctive diamond pattern bark in a mature tree, more smooth when they're young. And then flower galls are really prominent on white ash. Here's what a green ash might look like in our landscapes, a relatively small or medium sized green ash in our landscapes. This is called decurrent growth when it's rounded like this, unlike a linden tree or a spruce tree, which is excurrent growth. Ash trees from a young age really want to round out. And so that's a distinctive thing to think about. And let's look at the buds of these white ash and green ash. Here is that Hershey's kiss on the tip of that white ash. Here's a lateral bud within a green ash stem. And it's also looking like a Hershey's kiss to me. And I love Hershey's kisses, so that's probably why I see these everywhere. Another thing to think about between green ash and white ash, pardon me there, the green ash has this D-shaped leaf scar. The white ash has this C-shaped smiling at you leaf scar. So here we are looking at that again in the winter. Green ash is primarily D-shaped. It looks a little smiling there, but here's the white ash on the left. Look at it really smiling at us. That will help us with tree ID in the winter if we're wondering on ash. And here's what the buds look like for green ash, brown and fuzzy, and there's that Hershey's kiss. The leaves we mentioned are pinnately compound. Here's green ash on the left, white ash on the right. I don't know how important it is you need to know this apart except to impress your friends and family. Both green ash and white ash struggle with emerald ash borer, so it's probably good enough to know it's green ash or white ash. But here's the difference. Green ash, the leaflets are longer and narrower, and they're serrated. The white ash are often smooth, and they have this whitish underside to them. The green ash is usually seven leaflets, uh, the white ash can also be seven to nine leaflets. And they all end in a single leaflet at the tip of the branch unless something chewed on them. Excuse me, the tip of the leaf. Here is the bark. And look at how similar green ash and white ash are as they mature. I definitely see this diamond patterning, patterning in maturing ash bark. And it becomes pretty distinctive over time. A couple other things that help you with ash ID. The white ash especially have these flower galls which can hang on the tree all winter long. They're hard, uh, woody-like, and they kind of look like broccoli hanging on the tree. And then if it's a female tree, especially with green ash, they will be loaded with seeds in late fall and even into winter a little bit. You'll find remnants of the seeds on the female trees of those. Here is fall color. Green ash on the left is almost always a nice bright yellow. White ash on the right has shades of yellow to red to purple. So it can be kind of a kaleidoscope a little bit, but usually in our part of the world, red. So yellow and red for these different colors. And this is one of the most sad things about losing our ash trees is in Nebraska where we have muted fall colors the ash trees are some of our most reliable for getting to fall color, and we're gonna lose a lot of them in the coming years. So dead gummit, that's all we needed. And now as EAB comes to your town or to your area, you might start seeing trees with decline, with a lot of open branching and dying branching, epicormic sprouts and basal sprouting from the tree. And you might even see these D-shaped exit holes in the bark. Uh, from emerald ash borer, and that will probably help you identify ash as well. I will throw one tree at you to think about 
there is there are other ash species out there. You won't encounter these a whole lot. But this tree, the Manchurian ash, got planted in Nebraska a little bit here about 20 years ago or so. It is resistant to emerald ash borer. It has dark black buds. It has this really upright growth habit. The branches are very tight, uh, poor crotch unions. It's very similar to ash in other ways. And But you don't want to take this down preemptively or something because it is resistant to emerald ash borer. That's the Manchurian ash. So if you see an ash with a really dark black bud, it might be a Manchurian ash. Don't take it down. What are the trees we might confuse with ash? Well, it's probably other compound leaf trees. And here are some of those compound leaf trees that you might spend some time trying to identify. Walnut, to me, is probably the biggest one that gets confused with ash. And it has cousins butter, butternut and other walnuts. Possibly hickories. The bitternut hickory is kind of the spitting image of green ash, but it doesn't have opposite buds. Tree of heaven, yellowwood, maybe even cork tree. And then these compound leaf trees are bipinnately compound and or differently compound, and we'll talk about them later. The black walnut, Juglans nigra, and nigra refers to black. So walnut is Juglans, black walnut is Juglans nigra. It has a coarse open habit, alternate bud arrangement, seven to 12 paired leaflets, almost always more leaflets than ash, pinnately compound leaves, walnut bark on mature trees. There's kind of a fuzziness to the new twigs. It looks like sprayed on glue. You'll see a funny face in the leaf scar, I think. It looks to me like monkeys, a monkey face, a chambered pith in the middle of a small stem, and then chest, uh, check for husks and nut remnants on the ground around it. And believe it or not, in the summer, squish these or, uh, you know, pry these leaves between your fingers, rub them up, and you'll smell that juglon. Nothing else smells like that except a walnut. So here's walnut very deeply fissured bark, kind of like uh, green ash. But once you start seeing those side by side, the walnut really has a, this very attractive brownish bark to it. And it's, it's really distinctive and a wonderful feature of walnut. Of course, walnuts have these great big um, nuts that come on the tree late in the season. And then look at the leaves. This is that pinnately compound leaf, many more leaflets than ash. And they almost always, or some of these leaves will end in paired leaflets. Ash does not do that. These are the fuzzy buds. And here's that, or the fuzzy branches, fuzzy twigs. And here's that monkey face that I see in the leaf scar in the winter uh, for black walnut. Here is black walnut in its structure and form. I love that bark of a maturing black walnut. Look how coarse it is. Here's its summer form. They can be a little bit like green ash from a distance, but when you get up close, you'll start looking. Even from this distance, I can see that's not opposite branching, not opposite buds, so it's not going to be an ash. In eastern Nebraska, you might confuse walnut with pecan. They're very similar. They're close cousins to each other. Look at the difference, though, in the fruits. The nuts are quite a bit different. These uh, pecans and the hickories are generally have these ribbed nuts. And then in pecan, you have these recurved leaflets on the big, on the whole leaf. These leaflets are recurved and they always end in a single leaflet, not like the walnut, which has paired leaflets. Um, another tree that gets confused a little bit with walnut at least when we're, we're looking at them side by side in the winter, you probably won't confuse them in the summer, but in the winter and especially in a woodlot where they're coming up wild, I've been confused at time thinking I was looking at walnut and it was actually tree of heaven. So tree of heaven, some things that give it away, it's extremely fast growing. There's lots of distance between the inner node or the nodes on the branches. It has a suckering habit, it's very weedy. You run into it in back alleys or where most trees aren't being grown. It has alternate bud arrangement, compound leaves with many leaflets, more like sumac 
though, than walnut, and a very pungent aroma. It's in that same family as sumac, I think, and it has a very pungent aroma, different from walnut, but that's a good identifier of Tree of Heaven in the summer. Large heart-shaped leaf scars, winged seeds can be persistent on the female trees, and then there's vertical striations or stretch marks on that maturing bark that we're going to look at. So here's Tree of Heaven. This is the kind of thing you generally run into in the back alley, a forgotten forlorn place where most other trees won't be found. And so if you're in a spot like that across Nebraska, you're in a back alley or an abandoned place and there's trees prolificating around, what do you think they're gonna be? You can probably quickly come down to a few species. For me, I think about things like Siberian elm, mulberry, maybe hackberry and green ash, but here in eastern Nebraska, especially tree of heaven. That dang tree of heaven can grow in concrete cracks. It's just amazing uh, where we find it. And then maybe I'll go back to say, I said this in the earlier uh, program and I forgot to say it here. Another thing to think about in tree ID is this whole concept of when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. We're in Nebraska, when you hear, or when you come across a tree and you're not exactly sure what it is, don't expect it to be the most unusual thing in the world ever. Chances are it's gonna be something common. And that can start to help you narrow down your choices pretty quickly. Of course, we do run into zebras every so often, and those are the fun ones, but just beware that, you know, that helps your tree ID to think horses instead of zebras. Here is Kentucky coffee tree. Um, you might be able to tell coffee tree because of its very stark naked appearance. Of our tr native trees, coffee tree has the biggest leaf of all of our native trees. They can be actually three feet long. It's bipinnately compound. This is one leaf. It drops off in big bunches in the fall. And then the tree looks very naked, but very beautiful as it matures. It's like the ugly duckling that becomes the beautiful swan over time. The bark of a maturing coffee tree looks to me like it's stuccoed on in layers. And then these, uh, the nut pods or the seed pods of Kentucky coffee tree are very distinctive. You won't confuse those with anything else. Somewhat like this honey locust. I, the other thing I need to be doing here is re reminding you the Latin name, Gymnocladus dioecus is coffee tree, Kentucky coffee tree. And Gymnocladus literally means naked branch. Gladitia triacanthus is the honey locust. The honey locust and the coffee tree are both legumes. So they're gonna be related to each other. They're in the legume family, uh, but they're not the same genus or species. Uh, here are some distinctive characteristics of honey locust. We all see honey locust in our landscapes. One thing with honey locust is it can have this flaky peeling bark as it matures. And then wild trees often have these very severe, long trident like thorns on them that you don't want to run into at night. Most honey locusts selected for planting in our landscapes are both thornless and seedless. But in the wild, <laughs> they're not necessarily either. Another compound leaf tree that we sometimes see in the landscape, and which is actually fairly common now across much of Nebraska, is the Ohio buckeye. That's this guy on the left. We call that palmately compound because it comes from a single nodal point in a fan-shaped or a palm-shaped arrangement of the leaves. Here's its cousin, the horse chestnut. In Nebraska, we have lots and lots of Ohio buckeye, you may rarely run into a horse chestnut and may be confused by that. Their buds are very similar. Just beware that the horse chestnut has very shiny buds. And often both buckeye and horse chestnut end in paired buds at their tips. And that's kind of problematic for the tree at times because it can have real uh, tightly uh, connected branches that don't, they don't know which one wants to be the leader and they're competing against each other, especially in horse chestnut. The flowers of Ohio buckeye, the flower of horse chestnut, and the fruits of Ohio buckeye 
and the fruits of horse chestnut. That's where the buckeye name comes from. Esculus glabra is Ohio buckeye. Esculus hippocastinum is uh, the horse chestnut. Let's look at maples quickly. These are the four big maples that we used to be planting in Nebraska and still are in general. This is red maple on the left, sugar maple up above, Norway maple below, and Acer saccharinum is silver maple. These are the most common shade tree maples that we see in the Nebraska landscape. Justin, that, this is yeah. your 15 minute warning. 15 minutes, all right, we got plenty of time. Okay, here's the buds that help us identify these maples in the winter. On the left is sugar maple. If you see a sharp pointed bud on a maple, opposite branching, it's probably sugar maple. A round bright red or purplish red one, or even dark brown, but pretty thick and brown and round is a Norway maple, Acer platinoides. The red maple are small little round buds, almost like peppercorns. And then these are the buds of the silver maple. Silver maple and red maple both have reddish stems. They're closely related and they hybridize. Let's look at these Latin names. Acer saccharum, sugar maple. Acer platinoides, Norway maple. Acer rubrum, red maple. Acer saccharinum, silver maple. Both silver maple and sugar maple, the root derivation for the specific epithet is from saccharin or sweetness, but they both can't be the same name. So we have saccharum and saccharinum. You can tap silver maple to get a sweet sap for sure. Here are those leaves in the summer. Uh, red maple here on the upper left, primarily three lobed, typically much smaller than the other maples. Down here on the lower right, silver maple. You see why it's called silver maple. Deeply lobed trees with deep uh, venation and gaps between the lobes, right? So that's pretty distinctive of silver maple. And then sugar maple, if you can remember, that's the uh, maple leaf that's on the leaf of, or on the flag of Canada. Norway maple to me looks a lot like sugar maple. Often they're both five lobed. One thing about uh, Norway maple to be aware of in the summer, pull the leaf, and if it has a milky sap on the pedial, that's a Norway maple. Here are those leaves in the fall, the fall color. Oranges of sugar maple, yellow of Norway maple, red of red maple, and kind of the muted yellows to greenish yellows of silver maple. The seeds can also be very distinctive on these trees. If you see a maple with seeds, formed and ready to fall early, early in the spring. I mean, we're talking April, maybe into late April. That's gonna be red maple or silver maple. They're closely related. And remember, they're flowering in late winter. They're getting after it. They got uh, antifreeze in their tissues and they're able to put those seeds out in the bushel fulls, in, at least in Eastern Nebraska in a lot of years. Norway maple is a summer seed and those seeds are really spread out apart from each other. Nothing else looks like that in maples. And then sugar maple, those seeds mature late summer into fall. In fact, they can hang on the tree well into winter. We see silver maple all over Nebraska. They're the trees that really get big and round and you can pick them out from a distance because they often have about five or six or eight or 10 big competing trunk branches coming off low on the trunk. And kind of like honey locusts, they also have a peeling bark. Bark that is peeling, <laughs> I should say. I mentioned that red maple and silver maple hybridize together to create other trees. These occur naturally in the Eastern US, but they've also been uh, created in the nursery industry. One of the most common trees planted now is the autumn blaze maple. That's a picture of it right here. And it's in between both red maple and silver maple. Not a bad tree, but it does have some poor branching structure and it's overplanted. So let's encourage our friends and our neighbors not to plant so much of that. Acer by Fremonii, the Freeman hybrid maples. 
this may be, as along with silver maple, the most common native maple in Nebraska, and that's the box elder maple, Acer nagundo. It's kind of a weedy thing. In the winter, you can pick it out because it has really bright green, almost orange-like stems, a waxy coating on them, very distinctive of box elder maple. They're also the only maple we grow that have compound leaves, typically leaflets of three, but it can be in fives. And then another characteristics of box elder maple in the woods, you'll see this as you drive down a riparian woodland and you see leaves uh, still hanging on trees, chances are they're the seeds hanging off box elder maple well into winter. We're gonna run through some oaks, distinctive characteristics of oaks. Oaks are generally in two broad groups, the red oaks and the white oaks. There is a, a species red oak and a species white oak, but we also make them the two groups of oaks. So there's all kinds of species in the red oaks, several species in the white oaks. Red oaks have leaves with pointed tips, typically. White oak leaves typically have rounded lobes, but we'll see that's not always the case. Red oak acorns develop over two growing seasons. So even in the winter with a red oak, you can see little tiny bud-like acorns that formed from flowers this last year, and they're getting uh, gonna survive the winter and start maturing as their second year acorns. In the white oaks, that all happens in one season. They don't overwinter on the tree. Red oaks have more of an excurrent or upright growth pattern. White oaks have more of a decurrent or rounded growth pattern, especially with something like bur oak. Red oaks have more reliable fall color, generally. And in general, white oaks have greater soil stability or tolerance in Nebraska, especially bur oak and chinkapin oak. <clears throat> So here are those forms of oaks we talked about, decurrent, rounded. This is a bur oak, takes on a rounded form even in its youth, whereas a red oak or a pin oak, this is pin oak here, Quercus palustris, uh, is an upright tree that has excurrent growth even, even into maturity. You can usually pick out pin oaks, old pin oaks in a neighborhood because they're still upright. Look at this red oak, unlike a pen oak, as it matures, it will start to round out with age more than a pen oak will. And I'll just point out that this is the state champion red oak in the backyard of a, a rental property near East Campus in Lincoln. <clears throat> These are what the buds and the twigs look like on oaks. There's always this bunching of buds at the tip of an oak branch or an oak uh, branchlet. So or twig, just be aware of that. They don't all look exactly the same, but those buds are branched together pretty prominently on our oaks. And then in our bur oak, both the young stems and even the uh, big trunk bark itself can be deeply furrowed, uh, which is a consequence of, of its tolerance to fire. It's an adaptation to fire uh, tolerance to helping it withstand fire. Here's just a few of the white oaks in their summer leaf form. These are bur oaks. This is a hybrid variety of bur oak, probably a bur gamble oak. But just beware that bur oaks have a wide natural range. And across their range, even across Nebraska, one tree to the next can look very different in the leaves. Look at how different these leaves are. Generally look like bur oak, but a lot of variability within that. A few other white oaks to think about and to mention, Quercus bicolor. Quercus means oak. Bicolor is two colored, obviously. So the two colored leaf here is swamp white oak, the common name, really bright shiny green above and uh, kind of a fuzzy whiteness below. Here is the leaf of white oak, very distinctive. White oaks look pretty familiar uh, with their leaf pattern across trees unlike the bur oaks. This is English oak here with the very long acorns. And this is a tree called chinkapin oak. These are all in the white oak family of trees. This is chinkapin oak. It almost looks more like a red oak. It's a white oak and very tolerant of our soils in Nebraska. Whereas here are a few red oak leaves, pointed lobe tips, right? Bristle tips on the uh, red oak 
uh, lobes is pretty distinctive for most red oaks. This is red oak here, pen oak here, and this is black oak, Quercus volutina, black oak. The name volutina actually refers to the fuzzy uh, inner nodes between the veins on the underside of the leaf. This little bit of fuzziness is where the name volutina comes from. And that's distinctive of black oak. Red oak and black oak are the two most common red oaks we have in our eastern Nebraska woods, but you can tell them apart pretty quickly if you look at the underside of these leaves. Here are some oak leaves in fall color, which can be very distinctive for ID. A shingle oak really shines in this kind of yellow bronze brown, and it's typically pretty glossy. That'll give away a shingle oak in the fall. White oak, if you run across a white oak with good fall color, chances are it's white oak because English oak and bur oak won't have this fall color. Look at that really dark, more like maroon of the Quercus volutina black oak, and here's red oak in its red hues. We can also look at the bark of our oak trees to help us ID them. Quercus alba, the white oak, and Quercus swamp, or Quercus bicolor, the swamp white oak, both have this flaky, peely bark pattern to them as they mature. You see it coming off in strips. This is the pattern of uh, Quercus muhlenbergii, which is chinkapin oak. This is red oak. It has, as a tree matures, you'll see these ski track like striations on the bark of red oak, which helps distinguish it from like a pen oak. And then her, here's bur oak, deeply deeply uh, ribbed and furrowed, and that's its uh, an adaptability to fire protection. And then oaks, this is fun for ID on oaks too. Acorns can be really distinctive across our oak species. This is bur oak, Quercus macrocarpa, that Latin name macrocarpa means big fruit. Uh, so this, the bur oak can have fruits in Texas, the size of tennis balls, but up in Manitoba, Canada, they're the size of marbles. And here in Nebraska, they're about halfway there, maybe the size of a large marble with these really funky frills at the base of that bur oak uh, acorn or at the bottom of that bur oak acorn husk. Look at the red oak. I always can think of red oak as wearing a beret, a French beret. The swamp white oak is really distinctive when you think about it because it's the only native oak with this stem holding the acorn. They're often in pairs, and that stem is called a peduncle. And there's only two oaks that have a peduncle. The swamp white oak, which is native in the Eastern US and planted as a really common street tree or yard tree in Nebraska. And then this guy, the English oak, has also has a peduncle. But the English oak acorn is often much, much longer than any other acorn you'll run into, like a little cigar shape. Got just a few more minutes and we'll kind of fly through some more trees just to whet your appetite about what's out there. Come back through, download this PowerPoint and spend more time thinking about this. But two really important trees in Nebraska are uh, American linden and little leaf linden. This is American linden on the left, little leaf linden on the right. These are the leaves, heart-shaped leaves with serrated edges, very similar to each other. The little leaf linden leaf is much smaller. This is silver linden here on the upper right with that silvery cast to the underside of that leaf. And I might just take just a second to point out to you in Eastern Nebraska, a Japanese beetle is decimating the summer foliage of our lindens, especially little leaf linden. They love little leaf linden. They do almost defoliate it. Then they jump to American linden later in the season and they can work pretty hard on American linden. But these silver lindens, the Japanese beetle don't bother. So just something to think about. Another couple really important ID characteristics of linden are the zigzag pattern of the small branches. When you get out to the branch tips, you're gonna see lindens really have this distinctive zigzag pattern and these very nicely pointed buds, very prominent buds, usually brown reddish color too. And then another distinctive characteristics are these flower bracts. This is part of the flowering structure of the linden. 
They look like little leaves. And in summer, they will come off in great quantities underneath the tree. And people sometimes curse about their tree losing leaves in summer. That's just part of the flower structure. Those flowers, when they're fertilized, uh, pollinated, become these little seeds of lindens that can hang on well into winter. So you might see these structures on a winter branch of a linden. Here is hackberry. Hackberry, get to know hackberry. It's one of the most common trees in our landscapes, a great tree for Nebraska. Corky bark, uh, wart-like, a lot of wart-like projections on that bark. Nothing else looks like that exactly. Uh, in the summer, uh, the nipple gall is pretty prominent on hackberry, Celtus occidentalis. The leaves are leathery, and then they have these little small fruits that the birds love by mid to late summer. Uh, eating and pooping those fruits out all over. That's hackberry. Here is elm. They used to relate hackberry to elm, but they're not in the same family anymore. They're not related. Elms are a different type of, or a different family of plants. And this is the vase-shaped form of those old American elms we used to have all over, and we still have a few around. When you see a sh an old tree shaped like that, chances are it's an American elm or a Siberian elm in our landscapes. Look at this American elm leaf here though. Deeply serrated, prominently serrated or toothed edge. And then the back side of this leaf, if you'll notice, one part extends past the other side on the pedial. That's very prominent of both American elm and red elm, but not Siberian elm. Here are the buds of American elm. And again, that zigzag pattern that's somewhat similar to uh, linden. And then look at that compared to Siberian elm. Here are the buds of Siberian elm versus the buds of American elm. Siberian elm can look very similar to American elm over time. In my mind in Nebraska, when they get the same age, Siberian elms just look much more ratty with quite a bit of dead material in them and very light gray to uh, somewhat brownish gray bark compared to the darker gray of American elm. And then the leaves are quite different between Siberian elm and American elm. And just a few more I'll throw at you as we wrap up here before we get into our discussion. Sycamores, those of you in Western Nebraska probably don't see too many of those, but here in Eastern Nebraska, sycamore is very much distinguished throughout the season by its mottled bark of whites, tans, and grays. Nothing else looks like that. We're not gonna spend time trying to identify sycamore from London plane tree, but they're very closely related and common in eastern Nebraska. This is our ginkgo, ginkgo biloba, not as common in western Nebraska, but fairly prominent in eastern Nebraska. The fan-shaped leaf, very distinctive of ginkgo. And then for female trees, they drop these apricot-colored seeds or fruits in the fall that literally smell like vomit mixed with poop. You'll know you run into a ginkgo seed if you stepped on it or you picked one up and rubbed it in your fingers. And maybe we'll kind of wrap up here. Here's one I missed earlier today, but mulberry. Remember earlier when I talked about when you're um, hearing hoof prints, is it zebras or horses? Well, in the back alleys of our neighborhoods across Nebraska, in the tough conditions, trees that you didn't plant, but something's coming up. What's it going to be? Chances are it's a mulberry. And this is the distinctive branching pattern of a wild mulberry. They go all over. They have a zigzag pattern to them a little bit. They're an orangish hue on the branches, the small branches and the trunk. These are the mitten shaped leaves. But look at how the leaves can be very different across a tree. There can be four or five different kinds of leaves from a mulberry on a tree. This is the orange color and the zigzag pattern of the twigs. And then the fruits of mulberry. So Morris Alba means white mulberry. There's a little bit confusion about mulberry in the trade because there are other species. There's the black mulberry too, which is common in Europe and Asia. But we, our wild mulberry is the white mulberry, Morris Alba. The fruits look a little whitish when they start, but they all fade to reds purples and blacks in time, okay? That's our common mulberry. There is a red, a red mulberry in our eastern Nebraska woods. 
but you just won't find it planted in the landscape. Tulip tree. And then, well, I better do this quickly, Chrissy. Yep. We better do our evergreens. You're and good. Let's throw a couple at you right up front. So in our evergreens, we're gonna focus in on pines, uh, spruce and fir. And in pines, we're gonna talk about two broad types, the hard pines, stiff round needles in twos and threes, Austrian pine, Scotch pine, Ponderosa pine, and a few others. Soft pines, soft droopy needles in groups of five, white pine, western white pine, limber pine. Those are the soft pines, the, uh, the white pines. So here are two trees side by side. And if you're in Western Nebraska, these trees are very prominent, good trees for Western Nebraska. But let's know them apart. Uh, Pinus nigra is Austrian pine, that's on the left. Ponderosa pine is Pinus ponderosa on the right. They can look, look very similar in form, but when we get up closer to them, let's tell the differences apart and know what they are. These are hard pines, two and three needle bunches. Austrian pine, all of its bunches, all its needle bunches are in twos. The ponderosa pine has twos and threes. And generally the ponderosa pine needles are two to three inches longer than Austrian pine. Justin, I'm gonna put uh, a trick that I use when I'm out in the field is that Austrian starts with an A, which comes before ponderosa that starts with a P, which means that Austrian has two, and then three for Ponderosa. Very good. Very good. Austrian has two bunches, uh, needle bunches in twos, Ponderosa in twos and threes. You will find twos on Ponderosa. Look at the bark. Really wonderful. This is why we need to plant our native Ponderosa pine. There's not a more beautiful bark in our trees than the Ponderosa pine, and it's really uh, wonderfully colored oranges, reds, and browns. The um, Austrian pine has a nice bark too, but it's silver and black. These are the cones. Find a cone below the tree in the winter. If you have to, or it's way up in the canopy, look for a cone. If they have these needle-like cone scales, that's ponderosa pine. Austrian pine does not have that. And why do we care about knowing the difference between ponderosa pine and Austrian pine? Well, here in Eastern Nebraska, Austrian pine is dying by the thousands from pine wilt disease. Don't plant it. Ponderosa pine does have disease pressure in the east, but on its own, it's a pretty good tree. So let's know them apart. In western Nebraska, my hometown of Kimball, they're interchangeable. Austrian pine is wonderful, but don't plant it here in the east. Same with this tree, Scotch pine, Pinus sylvestris. They have this orange, distinctive orange bark very short uh, needles in groups of twos, small cones. Don't plant it. Pine wilt's going to kill it across our state. These are the soft pines. This is white pine that we're going to find more common in eastern Nebraska now. It gets planted quite a bit. It's not native here, but not too far away. They get really big, soft, droopy needles in bunches of fives. In the fall, the colors can turn a little bit yellow on the needles as they drop their third year needles and the cones are long and narrow. There's a cousin in Western Nebraska called limber pine. Uh, this is what the limber pine looks like, the state champion in the Kimball Park. It's not a nearly the same tree as white pine, but get familiar with that. Here are a few other pines. And then spruce fir and Douglas fir ID tips. Spruce have needles, stiff, sharp, stalked, square, spirally arranged, the pedial remains on the stem when pulled, and the cones fall off intact. Firs, abies, are soft, flat, flexible, stalkless needles. The needles more horizontally arranged and pull off clean. The cones point upright in the upper parts of the tree, and they disintegrate before falling. The Douglas fir is a real oddball. It has soft, flat needles with short stalks two silvery bands on the underside of the needles, but the cones have turkey foot bracts within them and they fall from the tree intact. And they're a really great ID trick for learning Douglas fir. So here's spruce. This is important to know your spruces apart. In Western Nebraska, Colorado spruce, white spruce, Black Hill spruce, really good choices. Not so much in Eastern Nebraska. 
but out here in Norway spruce is the better tree for us. You can grow all these spruce across Nebraska, but in my opinion, Colorado spruce is gonna fade pretty quickly from Eastern Nebraska in the coming decades because of disease issues, changing climate. Here are the cones, white spruce or Black Hill spruce on the left, blue spruce in the middle, and Norway spruce on the right. This is not a spruce, but get it gets confused with spruce. This is white fir or con color fir, Abe's con color. Look at those real soft upswept needles. You might run into a few other firs in the landscape. They're not common in Nebraska, but here is one called balsam fir, and I took that picture in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So it, they can be grown. And here's that Douglas fir. Here is that cone that falls from the upper branches of the tree intact. And notice these snake-like or turkey foot bracts between the scales of those cones. Very distinctive of Douglas fir. This is a true fir cone. You won't find them on the ground. And let's stop there, Chrissy. <laughs>